And instead of worried about standardization, we're worried about specialization in terms of these peer groups because the peer groups form around highly specialized issues. Think about it a moment. We probably train today a million students in software through open source projects such as Linux, JBoss, Apache, and hundreds more. And what is really happening here in these open source projects? You are actually through legitimate peripheral participation, starting at the edge of these communities of interest and, and practice in this case, and moving more and more to the center. You are actually engaging in a form of situated learning, the type that really does work. And basically, you are actually enculturating into the sensibilities of that particular virtual community, which is basically the essence of what apprenticeship is really about. So you're picking up the sensibilities of these communities, which is a very deep form of learning, and it is simply just happening. And these kids are loving it. They don't think they're going to school, but they're picking up very highly tuned practices and particular sensibilities. I say sensibilities because if you join, for example, a Linux group, their sensibility is a little bit different than the Apache group, is also different than the JBoss group, and so on. Each of these particular virtual communities of practice have their own aesthetics. And heaven help you if you don't understand and kind of get absorbed into that particular aesthetic frame um, if you want to become a central member of such a thing. But let's look at another example. An example that's dear to both my heart and, and, and Patrick's heart here is what might it mean to take these ideas along with the ideas of tinkering and ask, is it possible to think about reinventing the community library? You know, what happened about 100 years ago? Andrew Carnegie changed the face of learning in America <clears throat> by creating the community library. Um, we can do that again. But the community library reinvented today has to kind of honor many of these principles we're talking about here. And we can also do kind of accreditation. Again, a second project that the um, Design Institute is working on here has to do with maybe instead of passing exams, what I really want to do is to see the work that you have done. What would be the portfolios? You show me the portfolio. In fact, I have to say, in hiring a tremendous number of the people at Palo Alto Research Center, I have never, ever looked at a transcript. How a student did in college never interested me. What I wanted to do was simply see what that student had done. What projects that they built, how could they talk about that, how could they express themselves, and what their gut intuitions were about. How they did in class, I never even checked if they graduated. I'll let you some embarrassing things later, but that's a different story. <laughs> we do that off the record. <laughs> Um, but, you know, finally, let me say that what we really have here, again, is going back to this notion that in this kind of scheme of tinkering and rethinking the community library and rethinking this kind of virtual media that we have on uh, the kinds of uh, these uh, interest groups starting at the infinitely long tail, um, we really have something that we could unleash network effects that transform <clears throat> The, scale, the unscalability of kind of a teaching model to this notion of peer-based learning. Not only the N squared, but these then, each of these communities become part of the network they feed into each other, and pretty soon you start to get network externalities at work, and lo and behold, you very well may have something that is exponential. And this suggests, wow, maybe back to the future, think about the one-room schoolhouse but now completely repositioned in the 21st century. But what made this one-room schoolhouse so successful is the teacher wasn't necessarily teaching. The teacher was basically a coach and a mentor, getting older kids to work with younger kids. And I think any of us in this room know that it's not until you have to teach something that you really begin to understand it. These kids are continuously teaching each other. Um, and so it's kind of just meant as a kind of a metaphor, hopefully an evocative metaphor. Uh, but now think about how this in this peer-to-peer -peer sense, now goes global with tools infinitely more powerful than we ever had before. Okay, maybe we went too far, but wait. Two minutes, okay, <laughs> wait. <laughs> uh, this actually sets the stage for something else. If, in fact, we look at now the notion of the firm, the notion of a company, the notion of, of, 
of uh, factories and so on and so forth. The 20th century was really designed to work on scalable efficiency. That's what Ford started us down the path of. This whole notion of mass production or even mass customization is still the notion of scalable efficiency. We designed our vertically integrated and so much, you know, uh, firms in order to get scale efficiently. What would it mean to step back and say, in the 21st century, the architectures we should be using for the organizations, for the firms, maybe should be architectures that look at how to bring about exponential learning. Now, it's easy to say, but I want to show you one firm that has done this. Ironically, it's not from this country. And this turned out to be an aha phenomenon by John Hagel and myself that have been exploring this a great deal in our work in Asia. I want to briefly talk about Lian Fong. Lian Fong's institutional innovation. This is not a strategic innovation in some sense. This is not a product innovation. This is not a technology innovation. This is a profound institutional innovation where he invented what I'm going to call something like kind of a loosely coupled relational process net. Most of our process nets are not new, but they're basically transaction-based and tightly coupled, even the best being Toyota's uh, supply networks. Um, but he had this idea of becoming an orchestrator. Now, let me just give you some of the data, first of all. He works in the apparel industry. The margins in the apparel industry is about 2%. What Lian Fong's force delivers per employee in Lian Fong is being only an orchestrator for, at the moment, over 10,000 factories around the world that figure out, they know each factory so well that for any particular order that Ann Taylor wants, dot, 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 or anybody else, half the clothes we're working, we're wearing in this room actually come through this network. Um, it basically will string together a supply chain for that particular product. But these are not transactions. If you join this network, you can be guaranteed always having at least 30% of your goods taken and never more than 70%. Lian Fong will not ever, ever take on a captive supplier. And a lot of reasons for that having to do with the building of trust, which is critical for this relationship network to work as opposed to a transaction network. But the data I mentioned a moment ago, his employees make, bring in on a 2% margin, $1 million per employee. And these are Chinese people by and large. This is not pass through, this is what they stick. The return on equity sometimes gets as low as 30%, usually runs around 50%. Um, if you want to talk about a scalable scheme, very interesting here. But what's so interesting to us is the amount of constant learning going on in this network of 10,000 suppliers, 10,000 companies, factories spread all over the world, constantly working together, much productive friction, which basically Lian Fong's group does orchestrate, much issues of how do you put performance measures in there, how in fact within one particular kind of learning ecology um, will they kind of swap ideas, how by passing things back and forth and having things not work um, at the interface between uh, elements in the, uh, uh, in the chain here, um, is this learning happen? You can turn this entire thing into a very interesting learning medium. That is what Victor has done and produced one of the most amazing organizations in the world. And we can talk more about that later. But for the moment, let me say thank you.